Okay, well, this morning we're looking at um, a very familiar passage, the conversion of the Philippian jailer and um, his household. Let's uh, begin by reading the passage. It's, it's not terribly long, nine, ten verses. Uh, Acts chapter 16, in verse, starting in verse 25. And again, as you recall, last time we left Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, do, you're not, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, together with all who were in his house, and he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds, and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. May the Lord bless his word again to encourage us this morning, to strengthen us, to give us instruction in godly living. Well, last time, remember, we saw the enemy trying to stop Paul and Silas by sending a demon-possessed woman, basically to interfere with their work, to get in the way. For several days, she followed them crying out, these men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation, by which she meant really either she was trying to gain some kind of advantage by identifying with them, perhaps seeing Paul and Silas becoming more popular. She thought that Others would be more likely to consult her services if they thought, the people thought, that she was with them. Or perhaps she was simply just trying to distract them. Paul was certainly annoyed by what she was doing. Or was trying to mislead the people. Don't forget that what the people heard when the woman said what she said is not exactly what you and I would hear. We have to remember their culture. They would most likely think that she was talking about Zeus and how to appease him. But we did see this, that when Paul had finally had enough, he turned and rebuked the spirit, and at once the woman was free, reminding us that Satan is no match for the one who is the king of all kings, the one who has been exalted above all principality, power, and rulers. Satan has to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord also tells us that when we resist Him in Jesus' name, that He must run from us as well. That's going to be kind of an important thing to see in a little bit in the book of Acts when the seven sons of Sceva try to exercise a demon out of a person, but they don't know Jesus. It makes a big difference. <clears throat> we have an advantage because we know Jesus. Now, when that failed, Satan, as we saw, turned to another strategy, he used the greed of the woman's owners to stir them up. They dragged Paul and Silas before the city officials and charged them with proselytizing for the Jewish faith. Now, they were mistaken in that, but what Paul and Silas were doing was still technically illegal. But this is a charge that they believed would gain traction. By the way, it's illegal, but we must obviously obey God rather than men. But they didn't charge them with casting out a demon, you know, a demon out of a demon-possessed woman. They charged them with something they believed would gain traction in that system of governments, and obviously it did. Paul and Silas were beaten. They were thrown into the prison, into the inner cell, into the dungeon, basically the dark, dank dungeon, which was reserved for the worst of criminals. And they were fastened into the stocks. Now, it appears as though Satan had gained his objective. But we need to realize at the same time, the Lord had gained his. Okay? He overrules evil for good purposes. 
It was his plan that they go into this jail that they might keep a divine appointment. Now, this morning, we see that appointment. We see his purpose. Now, even though they had been, you know, falsely charged and abused, one thing we should notice is that their spirits were not dampened. Luke writes in verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Now, I th as I've already said earlier today, we generally try to avoid situations like this. We try to avoid what they went through because we think the conclusion is going to be simply pain and suffering. But I want you to notice that's, you know, that's not what's happening here. They may have suffered, to be sure, but they were also praising God. And the question we need to ask is why? Well, it's because they knew that this suffering was for him, was for his cause. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Paul says, I'm a part of the church. The church is Christ's body. The church is being persecuted. They're attacking Christ. But I'm the one who's suffering, and I rejoice because of that. Now, they knew, Paul and Silas knew, Paul certainly knew, that that is what the Lord had called them to do. And that's also what we are called to do. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.21, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you. Now, I think that if we were to serve the Lord in the way that Paul and Silas did, and we were to suffer the same kind of treatment, and we were to know that this we did in the place of our Lord Jesus Christ, if we were to take abuse that was actually directed against Him, I think we too would also rejoice. But the thing is, we don't experience that unless we actually go through it. Our Lord Jesus Christ, think about what He went through for us. Think about all the abuse, all the uh, you know, the, the physical abuse, all the verbal abuse, the, the spitting and the mockery, and then, of course, the crucifixion. Um, Don Francisco has a, a song where he, he has this one lyric, Jesus didn't die for you because it was fun. He hung there for love because it had to be done. Okay? That's what we're saying here. It's not fun. It's something that needs to be done. But there's also this rejoicing that can take place in the middle of this kind of suffering that we should be willing to endure because Jesus endured it for us. Now, think about this. If we were willing, actually willing to go through this by the grace of God, okay, by, by the strength the Spirit supplies, then what is there really that we would not be willing to do for Him? Because, you know, we remove the fear. The roadblock gets out of the way, and we're willing to suffer that. So we're willing then to do whatever it is He calls us to do. Now, think about this as well. If we were willing to do this, and we suffer for it, and we suffer patiently, think about what kind of a witness that would be to other individuals. You know, think about what kind of a witness this provided for the others that were in the prison. Luke tells us in verse 25 also that the prisoners were listening to them, okay, those in the outer cells. Remember we saw there's the vestibule or the, the foyer, there are the outer cells and then the inner cells, and Paul and Silas are in the inner cell. Well, those who are in the outer cells, who had committed the lesser crimes, who hadn't been punished perhaps as severely, but who still resented how they had been treated, and they certainly weren't singing, they were wondering how Paul and Silas could possibly do this. You know, what a powerful testimony, something that makes you stop and think, what is it that these guys have that we don't have? But you know, the Lord didn't leave it at that. He provided something even more powerful. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake that shook the whole prison, causing all the doors to fling open and the prisoners' chains to loosen. Now, A.T. Robertson explains that these Roman prisons, uh, well, this is what he writes, if the prison was excavated from rocks in the hillside, 
As was often the case, the earthquake would easily have slipped the bars of the doors loose and the chains would have fallen out of the walls. Now, A.T. Robertson is not an unbeliever. A.T. Robertson is a believer, and he does not believe this is a coincidence. But what he's saying is that God shook that place and literally shook the bars out of the doors, shook them open. And the chains, as you know, are bolted into the walls, fell out. And literally, it means the chains are loosened, not necessarily that they fell off, but they were still free. Now, was that just a happy coincidence? Well, I don't think Robertson thought so. He certainly didn't. Neither did Luke. Luke saw this as the answer to Paul and Silas's prayers, the prayers they had been lifting to God as they were worshiping and praising Him. Even as the disciples had before prayed in Jerusalem, remember on the occasion where basically uh, Peter and John were arrested, threatened and released, they come back to their company and they explain what happened and then they pray and the place where they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, the Lord here is again shaking, as it were, shaking up the prison in answer to uh, the disciples or the apostles' prayers. Now, this certainly got the prisoner's attention and that of the jailer. When the jailer awoke, he saw the doors were open. He assumed his prisoners had escaped. And realizing his life was now forfeit under Roman law, he drew his sword to take, to take his own life. But Paul stopped him, telling him that they were all still there. Now, it was certainly a miracle that God shook the prison and made all these things take place. But... This might have even been a greater miracle. None of the prisoners took the opportunity to just run out the door to escape. Now, likely because they understood the connection between what Paul and Silas had been doing and what had just happened. They knew that God was present and they were afraid. Again, remember, the purpose of the miracle is to strike fear into the hearts of those who see it, to stop traffic so they will pay attention. They were paying attention. They were probably dumbfounded. Well, the jailer certainly was paying attention. He called for a light. He quickly went into the inner cell, trembling with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, and it appears that this is where he took them out of the cell and brought them into his house, which must have been near the prison, he asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, one question that I was wondering about here, maybe you've asked yourself the same question, what was the jailer actually talking about here? What salvation? How did he know that he needed to be saved? You know, perhaps the answer to this question is what we've been looking at as we've been going through the apologetics, okay? Did the jailer know that he was guilty before God and that he was going to have to stand before him someday and give an account and that he, being guilty, was going to be condemned forever? Is that what he knew that he needed to be saved from? Well, the Bible says, yes, he knew that. All men know that they are guilty through conscience. I think the earthquake would also have helped to wake him up to the danger he was in. You, know, you, you add the conscience, you add the earthquake to the conscience, and it's like, God's out to get me tonight. But I think we should also assume that Paul and Silas had something to do with this because what were they doing all during this time? Now, I'm sure they weren't idle. Wherever they go, they were making the most of the opportunity to evangelize. So it's quite likely the Philippian jailer also had heard something about the gospel. At least they were warned they need to flee from the wrath to come by this time. You know, if we would just look like they did, at every situation that we happen to be in as an opportunity to bring a witness, you know, a witness, not necessarily the gospel each time, but at least a witness. We might find more people coming to faith in Christ, you know, even if they don't respond or if they respond, you know, maybe not in a positive way, but more a negative way. It doesn't mean that they're not going to think about what we've just said, what we've just done, okay? or that the Lord isn't using it in some way. You know, there's only one person that I've ever met that has actually done that, to my knowledge, who tried to evangelize everybody he saw. And I only know that because on certain occasions I was out with him and he would do that. 
uh, he wasn't ashamed of the gospel, and he had a tract with him, and he would, he would just give a brief testimony and a tract to everyone. This was a number of years ago, but he still did it, and he, that was, I, I respected him for that. Well, so what did they say to the Philippian jailer? They gave him the gospel, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. I think this is perhaps one of the best ways to summarize what it is we need to tell other people about Jesus, okay? A simple way to summarize the gospel. And I think if we use this one sentence, essentially, compound sentence, uh, and work from the back end to the front, then I think we have it, right? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, saved from what? Saved from God's wrath for our sins. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They need to know they're in danger. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Jesus is the only one who can save us from God's wrath for our sins. The Father sent Him to provide everything that we need. He alone can give us the righteousness through His perfect life. And He alone has made a per, you know, the payment for sins through His death on the cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. To receive this, we simply need to believe. And again, not just agree that He actually did these things. Not just believe what the Bible says is true. Not to, just to believe. Historically, these things took place. But the word believe means to trust Him and to obey Him. Those ideas are included in that word. Okay? And that's why we also have to take note of the word Lord, believe not just in Jesus and you will be saved, but believe in the Lord Jesus. We need to remember who the Savior is, that He is the Lord. If we trust Him, we must also obey Him. That's also, by the way, uh, why John the Baptist says in John chapter 3, everyone who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who does not obey Him will not see eternal life, but the wrath of God abides in Him. But do you know that the word, therefore, believe and obey is exactly the same word in the Greek because that word carries with it the idea of obedience. So, the simple gospel, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, saved from the wrath of God. Jesus is the only Savior. You have to trust Him, but you also have to obey Him. Now, notice also that this promise applied to His household, and we have to be careful how we understand what he says here, because it, it is often misunderstood, I think. Okay, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, it almost sounds like what Paul and Silas are saying to the Philippian jailer is if you believe, your house is going to be saved too. Okay, if you believe, they'll be saved. Okay, and I think a number of people interpret it that way, that maybe they'll eventually be saved. You know, there's, again, there are promises, certainly, that God makes uh, to believers and their children, but the children have to believe, okay? Well, let's not forget what Jesus said earlier, though, that the gospel more often divides a house than unites it. You know, I'm, it, it's sad, but that is the case. But much less can we understand what, what Paul and Silas are saying to the Philippian jailer is, if you believe, your whole house is automatically saved, Obviously, that can't be the case, okay? They, they just simply meant by this that if those who are in your house believe, they also will be saved. And so what do we read here? They spoke the word to the jailer together with all who were in the house, and Luke tells us that they all believed. Now, again, here is one of those few exceptions to the rule. The greatest blessing that any family could possibly know. Everyone came to faith in Christ. And again, who was in the house? Uh, how old was the jailer? Was the jailer married? You know, were there infants in there? Well, we don't know. You know, was there small children? Were his children grown and gone? Were there servants? Well, we know this. They all believed, whoever was in there. So they must have had the capacity to believe. And that was the greatest, as I've said, the greatest blessing any family could possibly know. Now, notice 
also the immediate change that takes place in their lives. The jailer cared for the wounds that they had. He and his household were baptized. He brought them back to his house and he, he fed them. And he rejoiced. Not only that he, but his whole household had believed in the gospel. By the way, there's another way that this verse is translated, which makes no sense at all. And I don't believe that that's how it should be translated. But um, that last part is where it says this. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. Okay, the other way this is interpreted is that uh, he, he rejoiced greatly with his household because he believed in God. In other words, none of the rest of them did, but they rejoiced with him because he was saved. Now, that doesn't make any sense at all, but it does make sense that he rejoiced because he, with his whole household, believed in the Lord. But again, notice the change, rejoicing, serving, doing what they could to alleviate the pain of these who had just suffered for the gospel. They had an interest in serving the Lord, and that's something that comes along with conversion, isn't it? I mean, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross. Well, the evidence that a person is actually trusting Jesus is he takes up his cross and begins to follow, and that's exactly what they were doing. They put aside everything else that they might have otherwise done, and they began to focus on how they can minister to the Lord by ministering to his servants. Now, in closing, I wanted to see just one other thing from this text that I think has apologetic significance, and that is the difference in the way that the Lord saves the, the last, you know, three groups, so to speak, that we've seen, Lydia, the jailer, and the jailer's household. Now, he saved Lydia through the Word, okay? As she listened to Paul teach, he opened her heart to receive what he was saying. With the jailer, he sent an earthquake, okay, to wake him up. He, he sent this miracle. None of the prisoners tried to escape before he brought the word in a saving way. And with the jailer's household, he again brought the word. But we should assume if these people in his house did not hear the earthquake, that the jailer brought a testimony. Uh, he, he told them what had, what had taken place. And, of course, because of the relationship they had with him, they, they believed him. Now, what all these conversions share in common is, of course, the Word of God, and this is what the Lord uses to save. Again, Paul writes in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If we want to see anyone come to Jesus Christ... We not only need to have witness true, virtuous life, we need to have the gospel. We need to share the gospel with them. And, of course, the Spirit has to work through the gospel to make it powerful to save. It doesn't automatically happen when you share the gospel. But if it's the Lord's will, the Spirit will use it to save them. And there is nothing in heaven and earth, nothing in heaven would want to stop this, nothing on earth or hell that could stop it from taking place. It will take place. What? Tremendous confidence, right? But the apologetic point, they differ with regard to the kind of evidence that the Lord gave them, right? Lydia was a worshiper of God. She was a God-fearer. She was a convert to Judaism. She was already convinced that the God of Israel was the true God and that the Old Testament was His Word. Now, we don't know what kind of evidence, what kind of proof the Lord gave to her, but we do know that He nailed it down with the Holy Spirit, okay? So perhaps it was by looking at the Jewish community, perhaps by reading the Old Testament, the miracles in the Old Testament. Okay, we don't know. Now, the jailer did not share her same conviction. He was just pure Gentile. So the Lord authenticated his word. He gave proof. He gave evidence by sending an earthquake to fortify Paul and Silas's, you know, testimony. And in answer to their prayer, that would be um, quite a, um, a showstopper, I think. But he also did this for the jailer's household in still another way. I think it was through the testimony of the jailer. Maybe they heard the earthquake, maybe they didn't. 
But certainly the jailer would say, hey, guys, guess what happened to me? And then he explained what happened. And again, because they knew him, they believed he was telling them the truth. He was a reliable witness. So then the question comes, all right, so what does the Lord do today? What kind of proof does He give today with regard to whether or not what we're hearing in the gospel is true? Well, we know He no longer does miracles. He doesn't need to do miracles because He's already fully authenticated His Word through miracles. But he, what He does is something similar to what he gave the jailer's household. I mean, what did they receive? The jailer's testimony of what the Lord had done because they considered him a reliable witness, they accepted it, and the gospel. So what does the Lord give to us today? Well, he gives to us eyewitness testimonies to the miracles that he's already done to authenticate his word in the word, and he has given it to us basically as a reliable source of history. Now, R.C. is going to tell us this evening, if we want to prove the Bible is the Word of God, that's where we need to start, with the Bible as a reliable historic witness to what took place in those days. And we start from there. That's essentially what the Lord used to convert the jailer's household. So again, I just wanted to say that to prepare us for what it is that R.C. is going to give us this evening, uh, and to see it as, a, as one way, at least, of proving the Bible is His Word. But let's not forget, we need, we need the words, okay? The Word must be given, and as the Lord on numerous occasions gives, He gives proof, and He leaves it up to the Holy Spirit to persuade. With all of that going for us, again, let's remember that we need to be willing to, to suffer, even to a small degree, to share the gospel with others. If we're not willing to suffer, we're really not going to do it, right? So we need to overcome that hesitancy. And let's, as we seek to do that, let's look at Jesus again, His example, what He was willing to do in order to bring us to faith in Christ. He overcame any hesitancy. He did whatever needed to be done. And Paul and Silas prove that you don't have to be God in human flesh in order to do that. You just need the Spirit of God. Well, let's uh, bow in a moment of prayer and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard and to prepare to come to the table.